Good morning and welcome to our webinar this morning with Advanced MD and our vendor partner HIPAA One. Today's discussion, if you've registered to, for the event, you'll have noticed the title is What You Need to Know Around HIPAA. And so uh, as if you've participated or if you know much about HIPAA One, you'll know that they're the experts around HIPAA and how to organize your practice and how to care around that, that particular topic. So this moment, we're going to invite our guest to take over. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Good to be here. Hey, good morning. So I want to go quickly through today's agenda. Uh, we're going to cover some of the news CMS updates that you might uh, not be familiar with. MACRA MIPS guidance. What are they requiring for 2018? And what are the deadlines? When do you have to have the mandatory things done? Uh, what are the SRE requirements? How they changed this year versus last year? And what are we going to be looking at for the following year? And finally, you know, open uh, question and answer. The idea is to have you guys answer or ask questions and hopefully we can give you an answer during the presentation. Uh, we may have some time at the end, but as, as we're discussing topics, please throw it in the chat box, as Mike said, and we'll, uh, we'll get to those. Many of you have been on. Pat, uh, these are the three people that are presenting today. My wife introduced Pat last night as my alter ego because we continue to put outfits on Pat, um, and I'm a big fan of Halloween and costumes, so uh, could be the case soon to be determined. I'm Bobby Sigmiller, VP of uh, Business Development. We've also got our founder and president, Stephen Marco, here. Good morning, everyone. Happy to be part of this, and thanks for joining. So our resident expert, and again, fire away with any uh, questions. This is uh, the reason we exist. So a little bit about the company. Those that are familiar with HIPAA One, uh, we've been doing this for several years uh, with Advanced MD, and since about 2011, 2012, bottom line, we are the TurboTax-like approach for helping you conduct your risk assessment, bottom line. Uh, we do also have some HIPAA compliance training modules, policies and procedures, vulnerability scan, but the bottom line is we try to take uh, the labor-intensive, error-prone, mundane processes away from you, put them on our shoulders, and uh, you know, really let the software do its thing. Uh, another neat thing to know about HIPAA One, we've grown to over 7,000 client sites. These range from very, very large health plans, uh, EMR vendors, all the way down to the single physician practice, um, you know, where we have one spouse as the office manager, the other spouse as the uh, physician, and brother-in-law as the IT guy doesn't matter how big you are, we can scale and help you. The other thing that's important to know, we're not attorneys, but as auditors, we've got to understand HIPAA, the regulatory changes that happen, and, and we're starting to see more and more changes uh, as newer technologies introduced into the industry. Mm -hmm, absolutely, and one note on that, uh, on the disclaimer, we also uh, have quite a large group this morning, and uh, we appreciate you being here, and, and there's um, a lot of folks that have been using HIPAA One for a period of time and there's some that haven't. I just wanted to make an announcement and remind you with the uh, updated audits that are happening at the state level, they're going back as far as 2014. If you have a signed risk analysis with HIPAA One, we guarantee that you'll pass that audit. Just contact us, even if you haven't been subscribing to our software, we, we still have your data, uh, you know, per the HIPAA requirement to hang on to it for six years. So just want to take, want to make sure that we take care of everyone. And, cool. And appreciate working with you. Thank you, thank you. We also do this every time we uh, present. Who do we have on the call? Uh, so let's launch the poll. What role best describes who you are and what you represent? Are you administrative coding billing? Or are you part of an EHR IT uh, team, clinical staff, compliance, data security, or legal counsel? And the reason we ask this every time, and this changes, um, we want to know how we can cater the discussion better to who we're addressing. So sometimes we see, you know, the majority on the call is administrative and, and we can really uh, customize this. So let's give one or two more seconds mm -hmm. and then we will close the poll. It just, takes one, it just takes one click so we know who you are. Vote so you're represented. Okay, let's uh, close the poll here. Display those results. So we've got about 70% administrative. So this is good in clinical staff. So we will mm -hmm. uh, tailor like I said, this discussion around some of the administrative things that are required, some of the changes uh, that have happened this year. All right. So, Steve, let me introduce this. So, Children's Mercy Hospital, every time that we present, we want to talk about some of the industry challenges. And, you know, we try to err on the side of mercy, you know, have mercy on these poor people that have had a breach. And we were talking the other day and we thought, you know what, this is a good example 
of what not to do. And so, Steve, if you'll kind of explain the children's mercy uh, experience, how they had to breach, who it affects, and look at this from your own office perspective, what you can do to avoid situations like this, because they're very costly. Yeah, well, before... Before becoming, you know, a news a newscaster for this news, you know, and we want to show mercy for children's mercy. We're not doing this to uh, do anything except raise awareness uh, for why it's important uh, to do HIPAA security annually, make sure everything works properly. Um, you know, and and above and beyond that, um, if they had a risk analysis, things would be different. But mo more um, importantly, uh, we as professionals constantly have to research. Uh, constantly, we, we scour blogs and newscasts and mainstream news, and, 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 and we've distilled probably three and a half months worth of research into this one, one webinar. So let's try and keep it high level and, uh, and, and quick. But here's what's going on. So these are all uh, events that have happened within the, within the past 60 to 90 days and beyond. Uh, so... Children's Mercy has three different breaches within two years. So you have to ask yourself, how can this possibly be? Uh, th this is a culture where people will assume that someone else is taking care of HIPAA security and everyone assumes the best intentions, but sometimes it gets left behind. So the first, uh, the most recent breach that happened this year uh, it, um, affected over 63,000 patients. This was a phishing attack. So they got an email that was crafted that looked just like it came from one of the directors of the hospital. And they clicked on it and entered in their user ID and their password. The URL looked real close to their website. Everything looked really darn close unless you pay attention. You don't realize that you're being duped. Uh, it was a small group of, of office staff and uh, the attackers used those same login credentials that they provided to log into their email system and download all their emails. Uh, second one, so in... Uh, well, and if I can interject, oh, oh, Steve. Yeah. Captain Obvious uh, would state right here, any time... Uh, you experience these phishing attacks. And again, a lot of people are familiar with phishing, ransomware. I tell my daughter, ransomware is not the latest fashion trend. You know, it, it is a serious thing. It's not going away. All the records now are not in these manila little folders uh, with numbers, you know, color-coded numbers on the side. We are an electronic and, and digitized world. It's not, we're never going back. Don't ever click on anything and enter a username and password, even if it's from somebody internally. It's always a pull. It, you have to be logged in exactly. somewhere. You have to go to their website, and once you log in, then they ask you to change your password. But if you ever, don't ever, no one pushes password changes like that. If looking that should smell, should just smell really, like, like really bad news. So <laughs> stay away, just don't open it, ignore it. It's, it's not for you. When you're logged into a system, for example, email, Again, as Steve said, that it, it may say, hey, it's been 90 days, you need to regenerate your password. At that point, it is safe to do so once you've authenticated and you're within the system. But you're mm -hmm. never going to receive an email from Microsoft, Google, or anybody uh, asking you to enter your username and password in your bank account. And if, if you are willing to do that, just send your credit card information to me personally, and yeah. I'll have my email address ready at the end. Well, so. I got an email from, from uh, uh, um, about a data breach from Newegg. Uh, someone hacked the website and put 15 lines of code uh, to skim credit cards that are entered in. And oh. I just ordered that hands-free set. Oh, thank you. Right within the breach period. So <laughs> I went in and I used a stored credit card. So I was talking to my wife last night. She goes, well, you got to change your credit card. I'm like, well, they didn't hack the database with the card information. They just would skim it if you entered it in, you know, at that time of ordering. Nice. So anyway, uh, just goes to show you breaches have all shapes and shapes and colors. If that wasn't enough for Children's Mercy, um, a physician uploaded the demographic information of over 5,500 patients to a website. We're assuming for research purposes. The problem is the website was not a business associate. They didn't have security measures, and anyone could log in and access that data. So uh, that was, uh, you know, I'm going to say it, uh, you know, that's when there's no training and awareness. You know, this doctor's not getting test phishing emails like they would if they're using HIPAA 1. Uh, so, okay, let's move on to the next one. Uh, you know, and, and they're fun. If you click on it and, and the email's from us, it, it just means that you have to take a half an hour of HIPAA training. It's much, much more friendly than having to report a breach to HHS. And they come free. Anyways, I digress. So they had another breach of 1,463 patients. So I was at a conference last week, and they're, it's amazing what they're doing now with... Um, the Internet of Things, they have a patch they can put on a patient's chest to measure um, uh, to measure all their vitals. And instead of the patient staying in the hospital, 
they found that they heal better at home. They're more likely to get up and walk around and drink water and stuff. And so Dr. Levine, who heads up that, uh, that uh, program, made a fantastic uh, presentation about how they actually reduce the costs of healthcare. It's revolutionary and it's, 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 so we're trying to get things to change in, the, in that direction. And during the presentation, they were, um, him and a, another physician proudly held up their pagers. So what happened to Children's Mercy is, and I didn't realize how pro prolific pagers still are within the medical community. Doctors love to get a quick summary update about a patient. Problem is, if it's not encrypted, which most of the private paging systems aren't, you can inter intercept them with $35 worth of equipment so you can buy online. You can install software on, on your laptop through USB, uh, intercept those and uh, translate it. And uh, so it was an, um, a radio hobbyist that, um, that, that recorded this. So there's an example of what that page looks like. Um, so there's two class action lawsuits filed. So no, there's still no mercy. So after all of these have been um, reported, there is a um, law firm that's doing two class action lawsuits based on two breaches. Uh, one is because when it, it breaches the fiduciary duty of trust between a patient and mm -hmm. the physician, uh, because when you're working with the physician, you're in a very vulnerable state, and then you get a letter you know, saying that the data has been breached, uh, that, that kind of erodes that trust. Secondly, also, the healthcare is very expensive. We all know that. And we assume that there's a, there's a portion of our healthcare fees that are going towards preserving the security and privacy for us. Because of those two reasons, uh, those two class action lawsuits are uh, going on. You can research more about it. Have but mercy. See how I did that? Play on words. Have mercy. Yeah. Please have mercy. We they've taken enough abuse. Please stop yeah. it and, and <laughs> move on. And do your risk analysis. Okay. Every year, uh, Ponyball Institute, which is a collaboration of um, different parties funding it uh, that are non-related, sometimes competing. Uh, and IBM uh, do a annual update and, and healthcare uh, rings the highest for cost per breach, per patient breach. Uh, breach when you mix in all the legal fees, the settlements and, and uh, ongoing identity theft protection, uh, it adds up. And I will say that the nature of the breach is different now than it used to be as well. We used to see somebody who would hack in, grab the whole More know, recent events. client, client mm -hmm. list and all these things. Now it's the phishing. It's easier for the hackers to get you to pay a uh, ransomware fee and move on than to try to get in. You know, I, we had a, a conference, private conference with some very large uh, health organizations in the area. And, and I said, I bet you're like the Fort Knox when it comes to protecting the data. And he said, absolutely. I said, what keeps you up at night? And, and it was the end user. It was the lack of training, huh. clicking on a, 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 some malware or ransomware. And he said, I cannot keep up. He said, it's a, it's a shell game, you know, whack-a-mole. We yep. can't keep up with that, even though they're the Fort Knox in protecting our patient records. So training and awareness is big. And, and as he pointed out, um, it, it's one of the biggest costs in the industry per record. You know, the, uh, the HIPAA is nothing overly complex. It's just a foundation of controls to put in place, right? And, and it lowers your chance of a breach. So... Why would you be doing this? Well, you don't want to end up as any one of these headlines. We're not here to try and scare you or, um, you know, m do f fear mongering. It's just that it's a problem. Um, breaching of our patient data is a problem, and uh, it's happening. The, all these fines are happening for people that are not doing a risk analysis. But, you know, there is good news. Because we're not here to, uh, you know, to do fear mongering, we want to talk a little bit about... Um, what's happening on the positive front, how some companies are evolving and moving forward quickly. So LabCorp had a uh, infestation uh, of ransomware on a server network. They detected it and shut it down, the entire network segment. Uh, and so far, they're still determining uh, if there was an actual breach or not. Uh, but as a precautionary note, um, this letter went out to LabCorp patients, and they're a covered, but they're both a covered entity and a business associate to other covered entities. But um, this is the type of notice that you would get from a company that has to deal with the realities of a potential breach. But I just wanted to point out that they discovered the breach. They, could, they contained uh, the attack. They shut down lab results, were delayed for four days because they would rather make sure that nothing was leaked rather than you know, open everything up. So 
You know, sometimes you have to make those tough choices. So I just wanted to highlight LabCorp's handling of this. And, and, and you know, on a more personal note, and it seems everything is revolving around our friend Bobby this morning. Yes. This is an email to you. I know. Cue up the uh, violin music and the sad, sad stop story. So <laughs> this was actually an email I got a couple months ago. It was kind of ironic, and I read through it. Um, I, I love what LabCorp did. They detected that there was uh, what was determined to be ransomware. They blocked, disabled the system, took it down, uh, quarantined, you know, tried to figure out if, if anything was accessed, and then brought the systems back up. But uh, so far, there is no evidence of theft or misuse. I appreciate the fact that, that they're doing this. There are many providers that we go to that have no clue. Uh, if they were hacked by, you know, a nice... 12, 13 year old kid with a peach fuzz mustache, um, you know, at 11 o'clock at night, my data is out there. And, and there is an expectation of, uh, you know, we need to protect this data. Now, what we want to talk about here in a, in a minute is who is liable? At the end of the day, mm -hmm. the physician is actually liable um, with this chain of trust and, and data. And, and it is everybody's responsibility. You know, not just because we've got to do this thing called a HIPAA security risk assessment and there's the HIPAA laws and doctors take a Hippocratic oath, um, but there is an obligation, obligation to protect, to protect this information. So talk to us about this chain of trust. Who's liable if one of our subcontractors or sure. business associates has a breach related well, incident? Who's holding the bag at the end of the day? Do you, let me ask you one question before I jump into that, Bobby. Do you, do you now trust LabCorp after the handling of, of their... I, I love the way they handled it. I, I didn't get offered any uh, uh, credit monitoring, unfortunately. <laughs> no. Well, that's uh, a good but, sign, yeah, actually. But, but it, it, I, I did like how they handled it. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I will say there are breaches. What we find when we go in, you know, again, we've got a large, uh, you know, 7,000 client sites across the country. There's some things we can share and things we can't share. I will say we've seen it all, <laughs> you know, how, how they've been breached, um, you know, fingerprints on, yep. on who's been in there or not. But most physicians, mm -hmm. I can't remember the statistics, but it's it's a year to 18 months before they even know they've had a breach. So I well, love the way LabCorp handled okay. this. Okay, if you want some, some <clears throat> statistics, yes, that is correct. And in addition to that, uh, a, a 2016 AMA uh, research study uh, did a uh, very in-depth survey of, um, well, ge general practitioners, but of course there's many different uh, disciplines within that, within that context. And they concluded uh, that for every hour of patient viewing that the physician had, they were spending two hours entering um, data into their EHR, uh, notes, observations, and so forth. It's very important to have that information. And doctors feel a, a duty of trust to the patients to have that information in so that it's available to them. So that's a lot of information. That's a lot of information, a lot of time and energy that goes into that data. So that trust established with the patient and the physician and the physician staying up late, making sure that those notes are in so that the patient gets the best care possible, now trusts a billing company or trusts another uh, business associate with that information to perform treatment payment healthcare operations, uh, but that are done by a vendor that vendor may share that information that the doctor has so painfully entered into the EMR uh, with subcontractors to do subfunctions. So what, what the requirements are, real simple. You have to do your risk analysis as a covered entity. Any business associates that you give access to your patient data, force them to sign a business associate agreement because if they have a breach, their responsibilities are, oh, still in the thunder, to, to tell you and you have to tell uh, the um, Health and Human Services. So if the subcontractor has a breach, even if it's a sub of a sub of a sub, all those people should be having HIPAA security risk analysis. If your business associate agreement, if you look at it, it says that by signing the business associate agreement, any vendors that they exchange your EPHI with will also be doing a HIPAA security risk analysis and honoring and understanding that they fall under the HIPAA privacy laws for uh, notifying you if a patient comes to them, not them releasing their information. They need to s reference that to you. So those are some of the idiosyncrasies that, that need to be accounted for and we cover within our uh, privacy risk analysis. Anyways, um, so you got that 60-day notice. So each entity has to notify the other. And as soon as a covered entity is notified, that clock starts to tick. So when you're made aware of that uh, breach, you got 60 days to notice the federal to notify the federal government. And, it, and if you live in the state of California or you're a physician in primary care, you got 15 days to notify California Health 
uh, health and safety. Uh, so you have to know these state laws, which again, our privacy software does take into account. Uh, you notify Health and Human Services uh, you know, after you notify your, your state attorney general, and you have to notify those, those inv individuals involved. You gotta have it up on your website, you gotta notify them by first class mail if you get more than 10 respondents that are out of you know, address, you have to uh, n notify local news media outlets in the geographic areas of those ones that have uh, been rejected. You have to put a toll free phone number on your website as well as uh, on your, so you're basically notifying all the patients and if any of those patients uh, send it to an attorney, the attorney would may advertise to all those patients to call them to be part of a class action lawsuit and circle full, you know, back to uh, our friends that need some mercy. Um, so all these things go back to your audit. So that's why it's kind of scary in a way, and we're not trying to fear monger or anything, but there are things you can do, okay? So let's, let's go into what you can do now, the power that you have to control the future. So question here. We're going to have uh, three rapid-fire questions, so get up to your keyboard. Did your office complete a HIPAA security risk analysis last year? Pretty straightforward, yes, no, and I'm hoping nobody says what's a risk analysis, or I will reach through the uh, screen and smack you upside the head. Um, so real quick, did you do one? Did you not do one? It doesn't matter the methodology you used. Um, and this changes year over year. So let's, uh, and, and we've seen a transition. I'll give it a couple more seconds while I'm Excellent. delaying with comment, but um, we've seen a, a transition back three, even as late as two years ago, two to three years ago, 50, 60% of the people had not done one. So let's post the results here. But, you know, and this information doesn't go anywhere. So you can be candid. It, this is not going anywhere. I just want to know for the purposes of this call, just it's, it, it's, it's. Um, oh, I'm totally reporting. Anonymous. I'm yeah. totally reporting the 33% that said no. Okay. So did we post the I'm results? I'm reporting the 3% cool. that said what's a risk. Yeah. <laughs> That's the good one. Somebody in the room <laughs> smacked them upside the head for me. Thank you. And I will send you a HIPAA 1 t-shirt. Um, so 64% of you said, yes, you've done it. Thank you uh, for doing that. 33% have not, which is, which is, you know, understandable. And 3% said, what's a risk analysis? Next question. How did you perform your risk analysis? Did you do it on your own? Was it a spreadsheet? You know, somebody in the office said, hey, guess what? You're the new HIPAA security officer. Congratulations. And it's usually IT uh, or the office admin. Oh, okay. Where did our question go? No, no, no. It's a... Uh... Poll questions are showing here. Gotcha. So, mm -hmm. so do it yourself. A. B. You did it with the HHS security risk assessment tool that uh, was free. It hasn't been updated in a couple of years, but that is still a methodology that is available to use. C. We hired the third party, you know, consultant. They mm -hmm. came in. Uh, D. Is HIPAA one. You know, everybody in the room after this can take the rest of the day off if you use the HIPAA one software. Um, and then E is other. So if, if you did it some other way. So real quick, just kind of uh, discuss as a group, how did you do this security risk analysis? And let's close it in three, two, and one. Okay, so it looks like 34, 35% of you used a spreadsheet. 12% uh, do it yourself, 30% uh, IT consultants, so that's good, 4% mm -hmm. HIPAA mm -hmm. one, and 25% other, which I don't know what the other is, is maybe that's, you know, didn't do it. Maybe they did a <laughs> compliance analysis. Um, really quick, just to, uh, just before we go to the next poll question, there are two questions we'd like to encourage folks asking them, so we want to answer them when they come up. What uh, are there handouts? There are not going to be handouts, but this video will be available to you. And, and what then, is HIPAA with two P's? I don't know, but HIPAA with with one P and two A's uh, stands for the Health Information Portability. Insurance. Uh, Health Insurance Portability and, and Accountability, Accountability Act. Act. Yep. So the P stands for portability, not privacy. The, the, the we second, have, don't forget, we have access to our patient records as well. That's the, kind of important. And the second P is silent, just so you know. That's, That's right. H-I-P-A-A. -A. Remember that. So uh, last question I've got for you. If you were audited tomorrow, are you 100% you'd pass? And again, this is yes or no. Nobody sees these results. Uh, other than us and the group. Are you confident with the binder that you have, with the, the methodologies you've used, the, the spreadsheets? Other the spreadsheet yep. folks are usually the ones that say, you know what, I, I think we hit all the things, but I'm pretty confident we didn't go through physical, administrative, technical, and organizational safeguards. Um, and then there's... I'm the, going to assume that anyone that says yes is, you know, one of the group that has used HIPAA 1, you know, in the past, because we guarantee that you'll pass your audit no matter when it happens.
So let's uh, give two more seconds and then we can close the poll. Three, two, and one. This is always an interesting statistic to me. We had the majority of you that claimed you've done a, a risk assessment, you know, or risk analysis. Sometimes those two are mm -hmm. interchangeable in the world unless you really know, you know, what a true risk assessment is. But what I find interesting is there's not a lot of confidence, whether you used a spreadsheet, whether you had a consultant come in, whether you, you know, we are here to provide a 100% assurance guarantee we can get it done cheaper, faster, and quicker than any methodology out there. And so that we can change that 45% that are uh, confident they'd pass and really bring that 55%, mm -hmm. you know, over to the party. The, the goal should be there is no issue. There is no worry, um, you know, utilizing. It should, be, it should be that, you know, um, that should be the issue. And I wonder, we should have more poll questions asking, you know, okay, yes, you feel confident. Excellent. That means that you've got your risk analysis report. You, A, know where it is. B, you've, you've got updates, not only on the risk analysis report, but annually you're doing a full risk analysis on all things that have changed. So that's really good. And the ones that have answered no, I wonder if they can't find it, maybe. Because that's, that's a possibility. They get audited from 2014, and, uh, and, and that person's gone, and, and no one knows where that, where that report is. So beginning of the call, we talked about, um, you can spool those up. Absolutely. Uh, th things you need to know for 2018. And it sounds like there's a lot of question around what is a gap analysis versus what is a risk analysis. Mm -hmm. So Steve, if you'll quickly go through CMS update, what it is and what is, you know, yeah. kind of what's the difference between, and there's our, our okay. bat. The, the reason we've got the plane there, back in the day, you used to be able to fly in under the radar. Okay. Those days are gone. Someone's, okay, okay, really quick uh, question, all in, all in caps. When are we going to get to the changes? All right, fine. Okay, fine. We'll, we'll, we will press the accelerator button. A gap analysis is high-level review. Do you have a policy procedure or not? And if you do, is it part of your training? Is it implemented or not? A risk analysis says it takes that gap analysis, and if you answered no to that question or you, you don't pass, you have to go and figure out what is the level of risk to your organization for that gap. Is it low, medium, or high? Is it something you should invest in or something you can defer to next year? Uh, which are the things that are really going to come out to bite and hurt if you don't pay, pay attention? You want to preserve the capital within the organization and you want to reduce risk. And, and, and coming up, uh, Mila, just to let you know, I, you, you were in all caps, so I'm assuming you're screaming at me. In two slides, we're going to go through a lot of the MIPS changes, macro changes, things that you need to know. So mm -hmm. building up to that. Yeah, yeah. Can you smell the bureaucratic regulation text coming up? Hey, we're getting really <laughs> warm. You're one step ahead of us. Drum okay. Roll. So <clears throat> this is the OCR's example of a uh, gap analysis. So it's very simple. You know, here's the requirement. You know, that, that 45 CFR, that sends for, uh, that's for, that's the book it came from in the section uh, risk analysis, conduct an accurate and thorough assessment. Okay, do you have a policy and procedure for that? In other words, do you have a policy and procedure which is a code of conduct for your organization that's been signed uh, and approved and reviewed within the past three years that says that this is going to happen? Uh, if the answer is yes, then your first question is 100%. Is it documented? Second question, is it part of your training? Uh, is it part of new hire training? Is it part of annual training? Is it part of your periodic reminders? Are people aware that you're like, are you working for LabCorp and you know that they're doing their annual risk analysis? If uh, in, in this case, no, it's not part. It's just part of a binder or part of a file that I bought online. So you are now not compliant. So in other words, if you're audited by the OCR, this is what they'll do. You, that's, that's $50,000 right there, okay? So that is a gap assessment. Now the risk analysis takes it one step further. So I'm gonna drop you into our software because uh, you know we need to move forward quickly and, and, and uh, Milo wants us to get to the update. So, yeah, we're good. Um, so over here, we asked the question, HIPAA citation, there it is on the right hand side. Feel free to read it on the, on the black and white side. We do that for clarity. Uh, it just represents clarity. Do you have a policy and procedure for playing worker sanctions? Very simple question, yes or no. If you say yes, then the attachments window and that red message shows up. It wants you to prove it. This is the how far is it implemented. Uh, if you answer yes and it meets those requirements, you upload it. If you click on no, the question says don't try and fix it right now. Just put some documents there in the notes field. Maybe we have one from 20, you know, from 2006. Hey, that's worth something. Upload it if you have it as well. Because the OCR just did an update uh, on their general instructions on how to reply to an audit and they will not accept employee handbooks or a library of policies and procedures if you're audited, they will fail you right away. You have to provide the policy and procedure for that citation, which is exactly what we do within HIPAA 1. You answer no, 
And then at this point, there's material risk. You have a gap in compliance. This is a problem. So we're going to document it for you. We're going to run it through the NIST 800-30 revision 1 compliant uh, 3 by 3 risk level matrix. We're going to assign a likelihood and, and, and impact based on the vulnerability for the threat that we're concerned with. That's as much jargon as I'll speak. And then it gives you a risk rating. Do you need, is it high, medium, or low? Then the software does that at a fraction of a second and gives you the suggestion. The HIPAA citation follows it everywhere. Who should do what? And you can even click on the question that, that um, the link to show you that question to have that dialogue. And when you do that, it'll give you the ability to download the policy and procedure after the risk analysis has been signed and it's ready for use in Microsoft Word format. Two of the back two screens, if you just pop that right there. Um, the regulatory text, the HIPAA citations change. We had uh, a year, uh, this was a couple years back, they had about 800 plus changes to the HIPAA citation for security and about 708 to privacy, and they were different lines. So one of the things, if you're doing this via spreadsheets or on your own, that is literally, and I use that word literally, impossible to track. So our job, every time there's a federal or state change, we get in there and, and we will err on the side of the most stringent. So when you're asking what are the changes, those are the changes. That's the moving target that happens every year. Um, that is a big deal, and, and we take care of that for you. So uh, thank you're welcome for many nights and weekends back. The other is that threat matrix Steve talked about, likelihood times impact equals risk. If you're doing this on your own, You've got to go through every control and assign a risk to it. The software does it for you. So again, many nights and weekends back for you to uh, focus on your uh, best hobby. No, that's a good point. Uh, 2016, uh, that was uh, when the Office for Civil Rights updated the audit protocol itself, and there was 800 plus uh, changes. So uh, we were the first in the industry to be compliant with those changes. So uh, that's um, something All right. Worth Something worth noting as we This is the moment you've been waiting client. for. Mm -hmm. Oh, the updates. Okay, ready? Well, actually, you, you probably already know this, uh, but you do have to do your risk analysis annually. Um, and this year, it's due if you're participating. Okay, this is MIPS, but, uh, you know, any state attorney general for, uh, like, the state of uh, Connecticut uh, social services um, for uh, a Medicaid distribution has to do periodic entitlement audits. So uh, Connecticut's doing meaningful use audit from 2014. It's federal dollars, but they can do it while they're there. So um, it's one of those things where we're talking about MIPS here, but if you get any sort of government reimbursement program or from the state or federal, you need to get your risk analysis done annually. Um, so uh, it needs to be done by December 31st, even though they say submission is March 31st. December, or, um, December 31st, is when the performance period closes. That's when you must complete your risk analysis for this year. That does not mean you take your risk analysis from 2014 because you found it on a shared drive somewhere from some old spreadsheet that has been updated with the OCR protocol and say, oh, we actually got a new laptop. We don't have that XP laptop anymore and say that you've done your update. That's not what a risk analysis update is. You need to verify all the data from last year and up note any changes. If you're using HIPAA 1, you click a button, it imports not only all your answers from last year, but also any updates that anyone's done with new policies and procedures and pre-populates a question for you with everything. You can literally just review it and go, yep, it's current, click save, and, and you move on to the next question. So we, we try and focus on minimum clicks, maximum efficiency. So again, uh, you must do it by December 31st, otherwise you will not be able to jump in and participate as part of the... Um, uh, um, the base score um, requirements there for security risk analysis. It's about 2.5% or more. Okay, this is a fun one. Hey, here's the update. <clears throat> here's a big change. So CMS is proposing the Protect Patient Health Information Objective and its associated measure, which is what we do, security risk analysis, would no longer be scored as a measure. So wait, 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 wait. wait. I, I, I Are you saying that we, the people don't have to do risk analysis anymore? Yeah, so, so I read the article and I thought, wow, I came into work today, things were going really well and, really well, and we're out of a job now. And then I kept reading. Um, so it's not going to be part of that, that ACI score, but it would act as a prerequisite for participating 
uh, clinician to earn any score. So what does that mean? <laughs> it means you don't get to play the game. You don't even get to suit up. You're on the sidelines. You don't even get to go into the game unless you do a security risk analysis. So at that point, I looked up and said, hallelujah. <laughs> so it is a prerequisite to even participating. Now, if you're saying we don't care, we're not part of the MIPS program, that's fine. Um, under the HIPAA regulatory requirement, this is something you have to do every single year. So for 2019, this is proposed, doing a security risk assessment. Again, it's not going to ding you uh, the percentage of reimbursement. And that's been the big challenge is people were, were getting dinged and it was this dang security risk assessment, you know, that, that was, you know, uh, preventing them from getting these, um, this, this big reimbursement revenue. So now yeah. it's, it's prerequisite. Oof. Oh, that's a good one. That's, so, that's good. I, I thought we were just going to have to go and on yep. jobs back somewhere. to bottle washing okay back to bottle washing so, so uh, you know recent update on this we wanted to give you an update because this is a proposed rule it's not finalized yet the uh, um, comments were accepted and and, and 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 were closed on September 10th so the windows closed but we anticipate learning more later in this year in the meantime the annual HIPAA security risk analysis is a requisite uh, you can't get around you have to do it spreadsheet make sure it's updated by a certified auditor or a regulatory body good luck uh, since uh, uh, um, since the um, update came out, there's over 800 changes. Uh, and if you're being audited by the OCR or the latest states, look at this, that are running eligibility audits for Medicaid uh, payments, including um, meaningful use. So more on that story. So I, you know, I just wanted to cover that it's not just the OCR, not just for MIPS, but again, the Connecticut's Department of Social Services um, uh, we actually got one of our um, new clients that were audited by them. The letter that they uh, received explained that uh, due to the ongoing program monitoring efforts that uh, Connecticut's Department of Social Services will be conducting a review of Connecticut Medicaid electronic health record incentive program payments made to participating provider. And per that notice, federal regulations governing the Medicaid EHR incentive program require states to conduct post-payment reviews. So it's so this deputizes state attorney generals to enforce HIPAA, and in this case, uh, our uh, new client was audited for a program year 2014 desk audit. So that's four years in in arrears. They can go back up to six years. So, quick update. Uh, question: We have we have um, we have another question. Can I take another question? Sure. We have a policy that calls for termination of an employee if they went to a medical record area that was not pertinent to their job. We terminated an employee for going through a chart and they were granted unemployment. Here's, here's the point. The government bodies do not support their mandated regulations. That's why they're the government and you're a successful clinic using Advanced MD. <laughs> That's the difference. Okay, another question. Are you participating in Meaningful Use or MIPS macro program? Simple yes or no. Let's give you a couple seconds. And uh, while we're waiting, we had a question about pricing in about two slides. Uh, I'll share with you a, a promotion for anybody on the call. We have not released this with any of our partners. Advance and D is the first to have this go out. So we'll share that with you here in a second. Mm -hmm. So let's give uh, two more seconds. Three, two, and one. Let's close the poll. Thank so 60% are participating in the Meaningful Use Mac Macro Program. When we see this, um, you know, it, it doesn't give you the excuse to say, hey, I'm not getting any reimbursements. I don't need to do the risk assessment. Um, it is still under the bigger umbrella, the HIPAA mm -hmm. regulatory requirement. So let's talk about what's required for due diligence. Yep, and this and this goes across the board. For those that voted no, uh, if you're not participating, uh, you know, if there's any other state and federal programs, but more, more importantly, if there's a breach, uh, you still, the first question they ask you for is, you know, what have you done for due diligence? That's a legal term. So uh, we've got um, a host of things that when you use HIPAA 1, you're doing it automatically and it does not not take a lot of time. Uh, you need an external vulnerability assessment. We include a Nessus vulnerability scan across your entire public facing um, internet uh, hosts. We include training and education. This is, this is really good stuff to change the cultural behavior of the organization. Uh, we include email, simulated email phishing attacks. Business associate agreements, you know, we, we talked about that earlier in the call. You need to have those contracts signed and refreshed every three years. Policies and, and procedures, this is the organization's intent. It's the code of conduct of 
hey, everyone needs to show up uh, on time, you need to be dressed a, a certain way, there are certain standards of how the organization needs to conduct themselves, those are policies and procedures. You need to uh, be prepared. The Office for Civil Rights HIPAA Audit Protocol, it is the authority. So if you're, uh, if you're auditing and using HIPAA 1, you're preparing yourself for an audit from the Office for Civil Rights, they're the authoritative source of authority. All legal counsel will, will use that. State of Arizona uses it for their annual um, access program. Uh, so um, HIPAA assessment and mock audit risk analysis, we kind of went over the difference between a gap assessment, a risk analysis, and an and assessment. So it's all done within one click within, within HIPAA 1. Again, we try and minimize and we have 82% automation as a result. And of course, for qualification, any audits, uh, eligibility in arrears up to six years, we have you covered. Let me make a, a point. All these things Steve pointed out here, you know, what is required for due diligence? What is the, the big change? All of these things uh, have changed over time. How have they changed? Well, three years ago, um, it's it's interesting. Steve and I would observe yep. these audits taking place in a small clinic, and it would be, "Do you have your security risk assessment?" And they would, you know, plop it on the table. And depending on you know what the auditor ate for breakfast, whether they're in a good mood or not, they could pass, they could fail. Um, we've seen a major change in what they're asking for. They're asking, "Have you done a vulnerability assessment? Have you done training and education?" Do you have business associate agreements? Show us. Prove these things. Do you have policies and procedures? Mm -hmm. We've never seen that in the past. So these are the, some of the changes that are happening in 2018 oh, that we have never seen before. This is part yep. of the due diligence. Again, um, it, it, it was turn your, your binder in or whatever yep. you have, and it's a different game nowadays. So you have to have all these things. Documentation. Who would have ever thought that an auditor is going to ask you for proof of HIPAA compliance training, mm -hmm. but, but they're doing it now. Yeah, so exactly. all these things on this beautiful fan that's, you know, call it the Peacock uh, presentation, mm -hmm. but it, it outlines all the things that you need to have as a small business, and if this looks overwhelming, it is, if you're trying to do it on your own. Using we the software, it's, it's yeah. very, very easy. We designed everything from day one uh, to minimize the amount of work it takes to get it done. But most importantly, it's a foundation that will literally help not only save f millions in fines and settlements, but it actually has been shown to improve organization culture and morale. I encourage you to go to our website, go look at our reviews. Uh, and, and what we're finding uh, as the years go by is with training and awareness, it, people, it's a conversation. It's, it's, it's a collaborative conversation in the break room and, you know, uh, how, how the, you know, the latest round of email phishing attacks are going, you know, and, 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 and uh, just how there's, um, you know, that they know what they're supposed to do under certain circumstances uh, as they're, you know, you know, just log out or lock the, you know, workstation before you leave the examination room. How many times do you have four people come into your examination room and the, no one's logging out? You can access your record, you can click exit, and it shows you all the patients for the day. So that's very uh, important that when people have that clarity, and of course it's required annually. Uh, annually. You know, and, and it sounds complicated. Uh, we break it down and we're not gonna go too far into this, but um, it's three easy steps. The heavy lifting is step one, you have to get the information into the software. Once it's in year two, year three, year four onwards, it's you click a button, it, it updates everything from last year. It will recalculate your risk level for, for your organization every year within a fraction of a second. Otherwise, you spend hours going, uh, does this change mean I have a low risk or um, a low impact? Or what's the difference between a medium and a high um, likelihood? What does that mean exactly? So the software does that for you. It, it, it allows you to assign tasks to individuals. They can log in. They get email reminders. Um, sign and add reviewers. When you sign off on the risk analysis, that's where the guarantee locks in. You get audited for that year, we will back you up. We provide you with exact policies and procedures. So in July of 2018, the Office for Civil Rights did an update to the general instructions. There's eight of them. A couple of key terms that, that we are throwing out here also is, is the use of the term portal. The use of the term uploads will be accepted in Word format or, PDF or Microsoft uh, format or uh, PDF. Uh, that's different from, I'm going to put it into an envelope and mail it through first class mail. The use of the word portal. They're going to do more with, with, the, with the people that they have. There's a paragraph of the High Tech Act that came out that specifies that the Office for Civil Rights can function and operate from the settlements to enforce, to continue enforcement operations. So uh, they're updating their rule. Uh, they have a portal. So 
if you haven't been audited yet, I say given enough time, your chances of being audited are 100%. And Bobby, would oh, you boy. like to cut so, so here we go. This is the fun. To close? We, we had a question from Scott. How much is it? This is something, and, and you got to laugh. Look at the tomfoolery on the screen right now. This is uh, Pat dressed up like Willy Wonka. I love it. Um, Pat's always funny with uh, outfits. So we have just released a golden ticket promo. We want to eliminate any barrier for anyone. We, we talk to these small practices. We do surveys. The things that we hear, it's too hard. It's too expensive. I can't afford it. I don't know how to do it. So I am here to remove all those excuses from your lips and introduce this promo that we have and this is the first time we've ever done anything like this and we're offering it to advanced md users good for a limited time um, you have access to one free software license and i'm actually holding a physical ticket here and i'm bringing it to evo we'll be speaking at evo i hope you guys are planning on attending if you do the next slide is going to show something that uh, we're going to give you if you come to the show but not yet so this gives you one free license to our software. So if you are a do-it-yourselfer, you know what you're doing, um, there you go. If you're an existing user, you can add an additional location in the EPHI system. It's available to existing users, but this is primarily for new users to get in. Um, what we want to do is provide you with the service that you need and customize it. So if you say, you know what, thank you for the license, let's get in. There, there are some uh, terms, you know, you, this is an ongoing, you know, year two and year three, you'll sign an agreement with us that year two, you'll see that pricing to the penny and year three, you'll see that pricing to the penny uh, on the agreement. But it allows uh, that protection and provides you with the software you need and then the services. What if I need services? What if I need handholding start to finish? I have no clue what HIPAA is, let alone how to spell HIPAA. One P2A, by the way. Um, if you are not familiar with how to do it, we have professional services that you can add. You know, pay by the pay by the hour. If you need to add four hours, add four hours. If you want to do a full-on remote where we're reviewing every single document, policy, procedure, we're happy to do that for you. But this should eliminate any barrier uh, for you. You know, looking at the software that's available. That is the sound. That is a golden ticket. We actually have a physical golden ticket, just like in Willy Wonka. It is a beautiful thing. Um, we've got a question here. Can I kind of yes. this, this one yes. question before we go to the next slide? Absolutely. Um, if we may. So uh, business associates, are, are janitorial and cleaning staff considered business associates? Really interesting question. Um, you know, uh, why? I, I was, so we've, we've, we've had some, some experience in that, in that area on site where uh, janitors walk in and, and they have access to you know uh, faxes and folders and uh, other other you know uh, uh, patient charts sitting on desks uh, and and there sometimes uh, there's there's um, paper of PHI in the in the wastebasket that's 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 not a good thing uh, but um, what in in this one particular case the janitor was um, caught on video surveillance uh, after hours logged into a physician's computer um, watching porn. And at night, the lights are on in the clinic and people walking from outside from the sidewalk would see, you know, someone watching, watching that on the, on the screen. And obviously that's something that would tarnish the relationship of, of the clinic. They don't want to have that associated with, with, their, with their clinic. So uh, in that case, we actually pushed, we, we might have overreacted and said, you need to have that cleaning company sign a business associate agreement. And there was all sorts of arguments and discussions going back and forth. And ultimately, uh, we um, found that they need to do two things. One is they have to put lockouts on all their computers. That's mandatory. If you don't touch the computer screen or the keyboard, uh, you may risk other things falling on it when it's cleaned by the cleaning staff. So uh, lock those computers, now that risk becomes um, less and the clinic is not liable for those actions so much anymore. And get your janitorial staff to sign a confidentiality agreement if you're a little bit paranoid about it, but it's better to be proactive and simply assume that the public's walking through your offices at night and to disclose and lock up any PHI and put it out of sight. Hope uh, that's that helps. a great, great, great point. So, uh, Golden Ticket promo, promo is out there. Um, on the left is my ugly mug in a HIPAA One shirt. HIPAA One, get it? There's the nice HIPPO shirt. and then the number one. Kind of a play on words there. 
um, and name of the company. But anybody that goes to Evo, come see me at the booth. I've got a HIPAA One shirt for you. And then on the back, it, it also says HIPAA One, kind of like you're on a baseball team, but you're not really on our baseball team. We're going to have a box, softball. but they are, we're going to have a box of them, but they are limited. So yes. see us early. But uh, ho hopefully you're coming to the show. If you have any questions about pricing, your organization, uh, policies and procedures, again, there is no fee to give us a call and have that initial discussion. So reach out, info at hippo1.com. Reference that you were part of this advanced MD webinar. Just say, hey, I was on the webinar, and they talked about this golden ticket thing. What is it? How do I get my free license for a gold, you know, for the golden ticket promotion? And, and we'll apply that. And again, if you need the professional services help, we are there to hold your hand through the entire process, sign off. The magic happens year two. When everything's in the software, you push one button, everything from the prior year imports into the new year, and you're really saving about 80% of the time. You've got better things to do you know? with your time. Yeah. So, so our goal is to help protect and provide uh, services to you so you can focus on you know, other aspects of your business. So info at HIPAA1.com. Thanks for attending this webinar. You'll find more information about HIPAA 1 in the Advanced MD Marketplace. Also, all of our sales individuals are very familiar with our, with our vendors. They're very familiar with HIPAA 1. So feel free to call us and ask any questions. We'll direct you to the help that you need. But hopefully you found this as, as an informative uh, webinar and you were able to learn more about the HIPAA process and how your office can be more compliant. And thanks for attending today.